Okay, I just wanted to welcome everybody for coming today. We're really excited that you're here for the Gay Rights as Human Rights Conference. It promises to be a really excellent day, jam-packed full of advocacy and activism and education, of course. Um, there will be a series of events going on throughout the day, and you'll have announcements about when those are happening and what's going on. But right now, we're really excited to welcome and get started um, with our keynote address by Roberta Actenberg, whom Tim will introduce. Hi everybody, I'm Tim McCarthy, uh, one of the conveners. Hi, Elliot, one of the conveners of this conference. Uh, I will save the sort of all the thank yous for the end of the day. There's been a lot of people behind this conference and uh, have helped to put it together. But uh, I will leave that to the end of the day and just uh, cut to the chase here and begin by introducing our opening keynote speaker, who has uh, become a, a very dear friend of mine and a uh, has always been an inspiration and a heroine of mine, but is now also someone I can call a friend. And so it's my great honor to introduce Roberta Actenberg, who has more than uh, 30 years experience, senior level leadership experience in business, government, and the law, as well as uh, been a real trailblazer in the LGBT uh, and feminist movements. She currently serves on public and private sector boards and as a corporate advisor in public policy, uh, specializing in banking and finance, housing and economic development, workforce training, and post-secondary education. Uh, in 2011, Roberta was appointed by President Barack Obama as commissioner, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And she's the first openly gay or lesbian person to serve on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, so again, a trailblazer. Uh, she is also a current member and past chair of the California State University Board of Trustees, the nation's largest four-year university system. She is the director of the enterprise software company Andrew J. Wong, Inc., uh, and of the Bank of San Francisco, where she serves as vice chair of the board. Uh, she served for five years as director of the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, where she chaired the Affordable Housing Committee. Prior to her time in this presidential administration, she also spent some time in the Clinton administration as the first, uh, as, at first as Assistant Secretary of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity from 1993 to 1995, also in that position, the first openly gay or lesbian Senate confirmed cabinet official in American history, and Jesse Helms referred to her during the confirmation process as that damn lesbian, and she is still that damn lesbian, and, and, and he's no longer there. <laughs> so there it is. Uh, and she also later served as senior advisor to the Secretary of U.S. Housing uh, and Urban Development. She also headed the HUD agency review team for the Obama transition. A former elected member of the San Francisco County Board of Supervisors, she represented San Francisco as the director of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Her work as a corporate advisor in public policy includes positions as workforce and economic development advisor to major corporations and nonprofits. She also served as senior vice president for public policy at the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce and founded the San Francisco Center for Economic Development. Trained as a lawyer, Roberta served as a teaching fellow at the Stanford Law School, dean of the New College of California School of Law, the staff attorney of the Lesbian Rights Project of the Equal Rights Advocates, Inc., and she founded the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Uh, you can just imagine how many boards she's been on, how many honors and awards she's received. I could be here all morning uh, talking to you about those. But let me just end on a personal note. Uh, I met Roberta two years ago when I began work uh, with Julie Davis and a small cohort of activists and academics and policymakers who founded a new organization called Face Value to try to eradicate LGBT stigma in the world. It was at that moment uh, that I finally got to meet Roberta Actenberg, and, um, and I was struck by several things. One uh, is her generosity of spirit, the, I, the way that someone who has been at this for so long could come to this work with very firmly entrenched ideas, and uh, ideas that may have been good for a certain sort of moment in history, but may need to be revised. And she is always open to new strategies, to new ideas, to new analysis, to new people. Um, and that generosity of spirit includes, I think, a deeply felt, and I think this is where her educator comes in, a deeply felt desire uh, to raise up and train and inspire the next generation of LGBT folks, and I, I count myself in that group. And so uh, having joined this movement um, more recently, uh, I have been, I will always be indebted for Roberta's support and um, inspiration in that. Uh, enterprise. I like to refer to her as the most humble, amazing person I know. And with that, Roberta. Um, I think you'll come to find out that the humility is well deserved. <laughs> 
Um, I want to say how delighted I am uh, to be here this morning and express my thanks to the Carr Center for Human Rights and uh, the Kennedy School of Government, and my special thanks to my dear friend, uh, uh, Tim McCarthy, uh, whom I look up to. Uh, and uh, I just think he is uh, uh, courageous and thoughtful, and I think in the years to come, um, he will be recognized as uh, a most capable leader um, of this LGBT movement, uh, and I recognize him as such today. Um, uh, this is not my first uh, trip uh, to the Kennedy School. In fact, I had the uh, distinct honor of um, addressing a group similarly assembled about six or seven years ago. And when I came to the Kennedy School last time, um, I talked about um, uh, how, uh, as uh, a lifetime civil rights advocate and a sometimes policymaker, I thought about the comparative uh, virtues of uh, what might have been a public policy uh, school education of mine, but wasn't because I, when we came up, um, I don't think there was public policy school. But um, uh, what I uh, what I understood it to be and what I imagined it might have been, as compared to my own law school education and legal training. And uh, I talked about how the comparison was very favorable uh, in favor of uh, public policy training. Given uh, the history of my own work, I was a county, in addition to having been uh, a lawyer and, uh, and a, a law school dean and a, a director of a, a public uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, director of uh, 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 LGBT Legal Services Program, the National Center for Lesbian Rights. Um, after that bout as a lawyer, I came to be a county supervisor. I was fair housing assistant. You, you might you might imagine that I can't keep a job, which is <laughs> could actually be true. Um, but in these various uh, in these various roles that I performed um, and perform to this very day, um, I longed for a, a greater, a deeper understanding of disciplines different from the discipline that I was schooled in, namely the the legal discipline. I admired so much the holistic approach that you all have been uh, exposed to. The appreciation of uh, cross-disciplinary um, approaches to problem solving. The a greater understanding of cross-cultural um, uh, exercises uh, deliberately undertaken so that we could understand um, more deeply how it is um, culture uh, becomes embedded, uh, gets created, and, and can be transformed. Um, I had only a, a middling understanding of social science uh, writ large, and uh, almost no understanding at all of um, things like quantitative analysis. I didn't understand systems theory, didn't even know anything about modeling one's uh, public policy solutions on best practices that had been undertaken elsewhere. So um, to this very day, I advise uh, young people who solicit my advice about, how, you know, how can I model my career after yours, or um, what should I do with my life? Should I go to law school? I, I say to them, um, if you insist on going to law school, at least 
um, get a joint degree. Um, study public policy as well as law. Um, even study business as well as law. Uh, study social science as well as law. Um, keep your mind open to other constructs because um, you'll need them if you want to really be an agent of change, if you want to really start to solve uh, the problems that you seek to solve. Um, so I stand by that, uh, even, even today. Today, um, uh, having been invited to be with you, I'd like to talk a little bit um, about my experience as a warrior in the LGBT movement um, and uh, talk to you a little bit about why I think um, old-time warriors like myself, legal warriors like myself, it's time for us to stand down, actually. Um, not because we're too old or uh, too tired or too cynical, um, but because our skills are not the skills that are needed today to help the movement take the next step. Um, why do I say that? Our legal tradition, the LGBT legal tradition, if you will, is firmly rooted in the gay rights movement that preceded ours. I'm always struck whenever I talk to my dear friend Phyllis Lyon uh, um, about uh, the origins of the Daughters of Boletus and the milieu in which uh, LGBT activists, or gay activists as they were uh, referred to then, um, uh, found themselves um, uh, and it was based um, primarily uh, as um, a way to um, meet others like themselves um, a way to understand the nature of their oppression. They identified early on that the fact that the sodomy laws existed and we were therefore criminals, and because we were criminals, uh, we were adjudged uh, mentally deficient, and because we were mentally uh, deficient, we were expendable, and because we were expendable, we could readily be fired from our jobs, we could have our security clearances wrested from us, we could have custody of our children taken away, and the long, long litany of the indignities that were endured in those days, the way to fight back um, was to seek to remove those uh, legal impediments uh, from uh, controlling our lives. And it's understandable why that was the case, and to a very small extent remains the case today. So we, the next generation of LGBT leadership took it upon ourselves within a legal rights frame to litigate these cases, to try to change laws, to get ordinances adopted and the like. We created legal institutions as we should be congratulated for having done so. We created Lambda, and some of which exist today and are thriving as well they should be. Some of which don't exist today, like National Gay Rights Advocates, which probably many of you never heard of, but um, was a very important 
uh, player in the legal sphere in its day. Um, we created GLAD. I see someone has a GLAD t-shirt on here, a, a very hallowed institution. As Tim mentioned, uh, my predecessor at National Center for Lesbian Rights, Donna Hitchens, created the first Lesbian Rights Project um, to call attention to the particular challenge uh, that lesbians faced in what was then, as I say, termed the gay rights uh, movement. We created Texas Human Rights. We created um, legal organizations for lesbian and gay lawyers. Bailiff comes to mind. That was a, the handiwork of a lot of lawyers uh, uh, in San Francisco. And we used those gay bar associations to get um, uh, recognition from big law firms. Uh, to get to give uh, prominence to lawyers within the legal community, to garner supporters, to get judges appointed and elected, uh, to be allowed to do um, sensitivity training in judges' colleges about LGBT issues and a whole host of things that I'm incredibly proud of. Uh, things that did actually uh, uh, make positive changes uh, in the life not only of the legal community but in the life of the larger community. Um, we took our example as well from people like Elaine Noble and Harvey Milk. Uh, they encouraged us to seek public office and to come out and many of us um, came out and sought public office. Uh, we, uh, we sought office, we, we won office, and today there are hundreds of openly lesbian and gay people holding uh, public office at many, many levels. Um, you know, the strategies uh, were, um, were successful for the most part. I mean, we've made enormous uh, progress under the Equal Rights Under Law rubric. Um, and I don't, I'm not here uh, to discount that, far from it. I'm here um, to celebrate that, and I'm proud of the role, albeit the small role that I played in helping to bring that about. Um, we redefined family through the use, the artful use of uh, family law, for example. Um, we made it possible, uh, legally speaking, uh, for lesbian and gay people to um, have children, to adopt children, to foster children, um, to have biological children of their own, uh, to make sure that both parents were in a legal position uh, to protect the lives and well-being of their children. Um, and that did a lot uh, to um, change the societal definition of family, to expand it, to broaden it, and to enhance the uh, embrace of family life in a much more nuanced context than had ever been true before. So I'm proud of that as well. I think we performed uh, admirably under the circumstances and helped the community make some very important progress. The progress um, is so outstanding that even places like Washington, D.C. have been profoundly changed. You know, President Obama said, I, I'm coming to Washington, I'm going to change Washington, D.C. Um, it's proving to be a little harder, I think, than he originally anticipated, but, I, but actually he is changing Washington, D.C. And, and, and in my experience, Washington, D.C. actually has changed. As Tim mentioned, uh, when I was first uh, nominated by Bill Clinton in 1993 to be Fair Housing Assistant Secretary, and, and as he also mentioned, um, that nomination was the first by a president of an openly gay person that required Senate confirmation, and my Senate confirmation was 
I mean, it was I, I ultimately won, which was the only important thing. But um, if you read the uh, the debate, uh, the filibuster debate uh, from those days, um, it will it will remind you uh, how things were then, and to some extent today are no longer uh, are no longer. In fact, uh, President Obama has uh, nominated uh, and have been confirmed dozens of openly lesbian and gay people, although it's not perfect. Uh, some still have to deny uh, their sexual orientation in order to gain uh, confirmation. So I'm not suggesting uh, that it's perfect, but things actually have changed. Um, when I was asked uh, by the White House to accept the position on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, um, and after I asked my partner for permission to say yes, and she agreed, um, I was waiting for the, uh, the uproar. Uh, and uh, there was none. Uh, and that suggests to me, even, you know, even in my own experience, I can tell you, that things have uh, changed, even in Washington. Um, as we were reminded last night uh, uh, by our uh, Papadopoulos lecturer um, that uh, President Obama has taken a number of important steps uh, on behalf of LGBT people and in this community in his refusal uh, to defend uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, in the transformation of the don't ask, don't tell policy, uh, and the like. These are incredibly important steps, and as a result of these things, in some ways, Washington will never be the same. One of my favorite uh, changes that the Obama administration has, uh, has wrought um, relates to uh, an initiative taken by the HUD Fair Housing Assistant Secretary recently um, to promulgate a legal theory whereby um, uh, LGBT people are protected uh, from housing discrimination under the Fair <coughs> Housing Act. And I particularly like that, not that the statute has changed, by the way, um, but the interpretation of the statute uh, has now changed, and I'm particularly fond of that one because in my Senate confirmation in 1993, I was asked in no, uh, you know, in very directly and in no uncertain terms, um, you know, I suppose uh, that, uh, Madam Secretary, if we were to confirm you, the first thing you would do um, is uh, to attempt to change the statute uh, to uh, uh, protect gay people from housing discrimination. And um, I vehemently deny that. Uh, and I, I actually was telling the truth. I was so scared that I wouldn't get confirmed at all. I mean, there was no way that that was actually e even first and foremost on my mind. It wasn't on my mind at all. So. Um, they forced me to deny it, and I did deny it, and that denial was truthful, um, which is to say that in 1993, I could not have imagined the temerity um, of, a, of asserting such a position, and in, you know, 2010, um, it is accepted parlance in the Obama administration to be an assistant, assistant secretary and to proffer a novel, uh, a novel interpretation of the Federal Fair Housing Act and to seek to protect um, LGBT people from housing discrimination. Same thing in the Department of Education and the Department of Justice. Uh, they are using uh, a new interpretation of Title IX to protect sexual minority youth from bullying. They assert that they have jurisdiction and have asserted jurisdiction in multiple uh, cases to that effect. And um, these are, this is very important work that they are undertaking. Um, uh, it, it certainly is not with the disagreement uh, of the Obama White House. It, I can only assume if it's anything like it was 
uh, when I participated in the Clinton administration, not only are they doing it uh, with a concurrence of the White House, but they're being encouraged to do it, um, and that is real progress. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton um, has uh, stated emphatically that LGBT rights are human rights, and human rights um, of this type are explicit elements of the foreign policy of the United States, and we will seek to have um, our uh, representatives throughout the world advocate in very clear ways on behalf of LGBT people, um, not just uh, across the nation, but around the world. That's incredible progress, and we've made lots and lots of that kind of progress um, under the equal rights, uh, equal legal rights construct. So, um, I applaud that. Um, as I mentioned, we in the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, and by the way, when I, when I refer to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, I'm told as a new commissioner, I have to offer the following disclaimer. I do not speak uh, for the commission, and I'm speaking now in my private capacity, not even as a commissioner. But the commission will be for the first time addressing peer-to-peer -peer violence uh, in the year upcoming. Uh, and uh, for the first time, the commission will be including in its examination of enforcement uh, by the Department of Justice and by, by the Department of Education um, on uh, issues of bullying and peer-to-peer -peer violence in, in public schools. Uh, they will, we will be examining the issue of um, the uh, violence against sexual minority youth, and we'll be including them in our, in our civil rights examination, building on the White House Conference on Bullying <coughs> that was held only a few weeks ago. Um, as part of that process, um, people have been uh, sending in uh, statements about their experience, uh, both parents of children who have been bullied, some parents of children who have uh, committed suicide, um, regrettably, um, and uh, students who were the subject of bullying have been sending their, um, their statements in, in large numbers. Um, and I wanted to read a little bit from uh, one that we received recently, um, I guess designed to illustrate the point of all of this, which is we still have a lot of work to do. Um, the uh, declaration reads, uh, I am a gay 18-year-old. I am now a freshman in college. I enjoy music, reading, the news, photography, art, and fashion. I've always been different, and in college, those differences are what make me an excellent student, a good friend, and a fun person. However, not too long ago, like many American children, those differences were the cause of daily agony. In seventh grade, my differences were not celebrated as something unique that belonged only to me, my particular gift. They were something squashed into a pit of shame. He goes on to say that he was considered a freak. He was made fun of because he had feminine tendencies. He was intimidated constantly by his uh, school pals. A teacher even once joined in the fun, he, um, he wrote, um, when he was being ridiculed mercilessly for applying chapstick in class. He wrote, I began to hate myself, and then he went on to describe 
two attempts at suicide uh, um, that he made wanting to end the misery that was his life as a young person. Um, I read that to suggest to you that with all the progress that we've made, uh, with the fact that we have marriage in place in many places, uh, that we have non-discrimination policies that abound, we have presidential administrations articulating uh, very clearly that we have rights to, we have statutes that guarantee equal benefits, and we've made many, many other gains um, which are not insignificant. We still have a lot to do to protect our children, to stop the self-loathing uh, that pervades so many of our lives, even still, to gain acceptance for ourselves among our own families, even the families we are out to, and to stop the bullying, um, the beating up, and the manipulation of people who should know better. And right now I'm thinking of the electorates who should know better and who could so easily be whipped into a frenzy uh, with the mere admonition of, Mommy, Mommy, I can marry a princess too. And I'm talking now about California and Iowa and Maine and the good people of those states who really should have known better but somehow couldn't help themselves. How can it be um, that in a place that's made so much progress, there's still so much left to do? Well, that's where the next phase of our work comes into play. Our movement now must address, um, as my friends at face value like to say, the lived experience of LGBT people, particularly our young people who get put upon so much, who suffer and endure so much stigma, um, who are often scarred by it uh, for the rest of their lives um, if they are, have the opportunity to live the rest of their lives. We need to start understanding what it is about being gay that creates that kind of antipathy that allows teachers either to participate or to stand aside while children are propounding cruelty upon other children. We need to understand why it is we internalize that homophobia and how we can do something about that. So this next phase of our movement work is complex and important. And I want to argue and suggest that it can't be addressed merely through an equality rights uh, legal frame. That legalistic thinking um, that we um, undertook so many years ago and put forward to this very day has been useful. Uh, some could argue, and I would argue, that it was necessary. Uh, and this prior stance of ours um, uh, helped bring us a good bit of the way. But it's no longer adequate to the task. In this era, we don't need just to bring about legal change, although we need to continue to do that. We need to bring about cultural transformation, transformation of souls, hearts, and minds. And in order to do that, new constructs need to appear, need, new leadership needs to be encouraged to emerge. New skills have to be brought uh, to the task of LGBT liberation. So I want to take my hat off to um, the storytellers and the historians 
uh, the social scientists and the activists, the researchers, the culture workers, the filmmakers, the artists, and the lawyers who will help get us um, to where we need to, to go. We need to change lives, emotional lives. Um, we need to learn how to address the, address the primal antipathy uh, that pervades so much of the way the culture treats um, LGBT people. We need to hand over leadership of the movement, in my view, to the face values of the world, to the Williams Institutes of the world, to the ground sparks, uh, to the glistens, to the glads, and everybody else who is going to take constructive part in that um, new form of activism that needs to come about to address stigma, alter behavior, uh, and change attitudes. Tolerance was what we as lawyers could dream about once legally sanctioned discrimination could be removed. Um, and we are tolerated well enough at this point, but our children still aren't safe. Now it's time to figure out how we go beyond tolerance to acceptance and acceptance to celebration of difference. How we go beyond equal rights to live equality. I don't know how we do that, and I don't want to be um, understood uh, to be uh, taking liberties with uh, Shakespeare's uh, statement in Henry VI, Part Two. Quote, the first thing we need to do is kill all the lawyers. Um, I'm not suggesting that far from it. But what I am saying um, is that the next stage of our work um, requires new leadership, new skills, and a series of new constructs. Now to be able to take that next leap, we need new people who can help us go beyond changing laws, as I said, to changing beliefs, attitudes, hearts, and minds. We lawyers uh, certainly are not part of the problem, but we must be humble enough to recognize how little a part of the answer we now know how to affect. Um, so with that, I'll uh, answer any questions you may have. Hi, um, projecting to the next presidential election, is Obama the best hope for gay rights? And assuming that he wins, um, what can the uh, gay community expect? Uh, how far would he extend um, civil liberties towards gay people? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll begin <laughs> by saying we're the best hope for gay rights. Uh, <laughs> um, we and our allies, uh, and I know you know that. Um, as far as what a president can, for what a president can do, indeed. Obama is the best help for gay rights that, uh, uh, that we have. Um, what can we look for him to do? Well, I think they're serious about seeking uh, repeal of uh, DOMA. I mean, of, of, uh, yeah, of DOMA. I don't know that we will have a Congress that will entertain such. Uh, it may be that they've already struck the, the heaviest blow that they can by issuing the uh, Obama Justice Department letter declining to, uh, uh, to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. Um, as our speaker last night um, uh, suggested, that may have uh, and was designed to have um, 
response in the courts uh, that I think uh, it, you know, it may end up uh, having precisely that kind of response. So it was a bold move on his part. Um, as far as uh, specifics, um, I don't know. Um, uh, as a commissioner in civil rights, I'm part of the independent branch, uh, and so we don't directly confer. In fact, I've never met the man. Um, although I look forward to someday to shaking his hand. Um, I don't know, you know, there might be others who have a, a better idea of what we could, uh, of what we could expect from President Obama in the second term. I mean, have others of you speculated about what kind of initiative a president could undertake when he didn't have, when he wasn't looking at um, re-election in the face? Well, can't he by like executive order extend full rights? Uh, by executive order, I don't believe that he could uh, do, although I'm certain there are more executive orders that he could issue that he has not issued until, um, until uh, re-election is out of the way. So that, that could be something that, that they might be able to undertake. I don't think that there's going to be much of a friendly Congress, uh, so I think what could be done that he could spearhead on the legislative front is probably minimal, but presumably there are other things that could that could take place inside the the executive agencies uh, that he would be willing to push forward. I mean, it's very clear from Obama's standpoint that this is not an executive order president, right? I mean, that, that's not his first impulse is to, to do that um, and say what you want about that temperament. Um, I mean, he does operate from a position of trying to figure out how he can affect change through the legislature, and obviously with Nancy Pelosi in the position that she had been in, that was more possible. Um, but I think he feel I know he feels as if the kind of legislative work has more legitimacy than an executive order would in the sort of broader culture of politics. And to the extent that he tries to as I think, I uh, forget who said it, which interpreter said it, or uh, commentator said it, he's playing chess while all of us are playing checkers. And that he's doing a lot of stuff sort of behind the scenes that we don't see. I'm not saying that I'm a, an apologist for him, but it's very clear to me that like, the waiting for him to pass a series of executive orders with sweeping mandates is not going to be the thing that Obama is going to bring for us. Whether or not we agree with that is not a story. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, you said what we need to do is change beliefs, attitudes, hearts, and minds. So for those of us who come at this from the religious community, what does that require of us? Um, well, back at you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, how do you um, conduct your advocacy uh, for LGBT people within the religious frame as we speak right now? I think we have kind of been coming at it from the framework of the legal side. I think we've come at it from, you know, trying, for those of us who are from perhaps a Christian perspective, you know, we have to deal with what's in the Bible. Sure. And I think what we've tried to do is prove that what it says that's bad isn't necessarily true. Um, and that has its pluses and it has its minuses. Mm -hmm. Because the people we need to convince aren't going to believe us anyway. Um, so for us then, moving into this kind of changing attitudes, um, if, when you're dealing with such entrenched um, belief systems, mm -hmm. What is there a policy way? Is there a well? I think it, I, I you know I, I think Julie might want to address this on. Uh, they've been doing some research on entrenched values, and I know Irv has spent a lifetime thinking about uh, about issues like this. So I want to give her the opportunity to address it as well. Um, I I would only suggest to you that at least in my view we reached. Uh, the limit of what the policy prescription can yield. I don't, and, and so it seems to me that we've got to go uh, deeper. And I'm not saying that it's easy, uh, and certainly lots of the things that we've been doing uh, in the interim 
have been getting, uh, you know, we, ha we have changed public attitudes. Uh, we have, um, uh, and very deeply held beliefs have been, have been modified on the part of many, many people. What it took to do that, um, you know, I'm not certain, but we need to sort of deconstruct that and figure it out so that we can uh, make progress, more progress on that front going forward. Julie, did you want to? Um, yeah. I mean, one part is uh, that could fund some research that's being done in Michigan around our people of faith. So there's a whole bunch of work that's being done and new messages that we can have in relation to that. But it's really talking to people of faith about how they can use, you know, on sorts of theology to really talk about this in a new way, and a new frame, and to attach to values that uh, we do the actually hold. So who's, is this Christian artists? defined, or is this <coughs> broadly faith defined? <coughs> it is broadly faith de defined. Truth. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it's important to think about how we can talk about it in the context of love, right? Um, and talk about what it means to be loving individuals and how we work in the community. And I think that there's a lot more room for that kind of conversation and meeting people in that space as opposed to trying to move them into the policy or even being a, a, a solid argument. Mm -hmm. Sure, if you want to observe. Um, sure, the Arcus Foundation will give you a lot of resources. I, um, and, um, you know, really the, the, uh, the work that was done by the faith community in, in California around Prop 8 and the reflection that was done by the faith community was very interesting. You can find some good reports and analysis about what people thought worked and what didn't work on the ground in terms of shifting values. But, you know, I, I was struck. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about my own take on these sets of issues is that I was thinking a lot about this, um, about neoliberalism, you know, about the triumph of capitalism, which I would define as a triumph of capitalism and uh, its takeover of all aspects of our imaginations, not to mention our material lives. Um, that, that's, and, and, and as somebody who uh, is left, as an old, old lefty who was never a sectarian and never a commie, but, but uh, was influenced by those ideas. Where I'm left is struggling and fighting for a socially responsible capitalism. When I think, of, you know, so I'll give you that. Totally contradictory, horrible place to be, my life. But, um, but I do believe that's what we're left with as a struggle of our next 50, 150 years, is a socially responsible capitalism. What does it look like? Because if you don't have a socially responsible capitalism, you, if you have the kind of bloodthirsty capitalism that we have right now, Forget about it. Everything we're talking about is is out the window. Um, and, and in that frame of what I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about this sociologist, this public sociologist, Sigmund Baum, right? Wrote this essay, Happiness in a Society of Individuals. And and he talks about how we're living in a moment where there's we're we're all being told to find individual solutions to social problems. And I I worry that about the LGBT liberation movement falling into that trap of individual solutions to social problems. Yes, it's about love. Yes, it's about people's attitudes. Yes, it's about values that we're trying to shift. But it's not about individuals only. It is about the social problem, the social structure of family, the social structure that allows certain forms of relationship to receive benefit and others to not, the social, political, construction of normality, that, you know, all of those kinds of things that we've struggled against as a community for 50 years shouldn't drop out because we've achieved formal equality. And my worry is that the achievement, that you, you stated it beautifully, equality is not enough. But the achievement of formal equality is very important, it's essential. It's Absolutely. Important. And, and all that. But what it can leave once you achieve it, you could become, oh, the women's movement, demobilized, calcified in these kind of old infrastructures in Washington that have no relationship. Meanwhile, funding is being cut for poor women. Where's the women's movement? Fifty years from now, I would like to not be living and see the LGBT movement be that. Yeah. Like some horrible thing happens and there's absolute silence from what I would like to see. 
you know, what I thought was a women's movement. I mean, I'm just saying a lot of things, sure. but I, I really want to, I wonder what you think about this question of how we challenge our tendency to find individual solutions to social problems. Well, or even if you agree with that. Thing, sorry. Um, let's, let's put it this way. What I do think is that um, individual, there, there is such a thing as individual responsibility, right? Um, and um, I think that's extremely important. It doesn't have to cut us off from the collective. Uh, it can be seen as contributing to um, a greater whole, provided there's a theoretical construct that allows that to be teased out of the Indi you know, million individual acts of kindness or million individual acts of coming out uh, or, or what have you. Um, so I, I grant you there is a, a, a tendency that has to be avoided, um, but I don't agree that shifting uh, from the rights frame uh, and uh, that definition of collective action has to be uh, has to mean that we are taking it from the collective to the individual uh, and making everybody responsible for himself. And I say that uh, with all uh, uh, deliberately. Mm -hmm. So I mean, yeah. you dis you identify correctly the tendency that has to be avoid it, but it's a tendency nonetheless. And whether or not we'll be successful, I hope I live long enough to see. Hi, Sorry. thank you. I'd actually like to, to build on this point, um, but to suggest that it, one of the concerns is not individualization, but a certain kind of collective movement that has not been able to bridge or create linkages with other movements. Um, and I'm listening to this this uh, dichotomy between rights, improving rights and legal statutes on one hand, and I'm not sure if we're controlling for whether or not <clears throat> we just didn't observe this in the past, but it seems like bullying is increasing. Yeah, and is. so I'm wondering if these two things are across purposes, um, and I wonder to what extent LGBT community is, is um, first of all, normalizing a certain version of what it means to be gay by, and, and sexuality and subjectivity and identity in general by insisting that it, it is this separate group. And then in that ability to be a separate group, it has not been willing to forge common cause with other movements for justice and equality across the board, or where you have all these people militating for, for marriage and no one cares about um, the kind of issues that we outline here, and everything from um, neoliberal, globalized, deterritorialized capitalism to poor women not having access to something more, more material. So, um, a lot of this is suggestive, and uh, and I, I want to be very like respectful of everything that everyone's done. I'm just kind of speaking out loud. I guess that's how one speaks. But I'm wondering, um, <laughs> especially you. <laughs> so to sum you up, texted me the question. <laughs> <laughs> how does LGBT, I tweet. Yeah, how right. does the LGBT community and can it is it is it able to right now uh, get out of this paradox and form yeah. coalitions with other movements that. Are, ostensibly care about the same stuff. Well, I mean, look, look it's, we, most of us came from other movements. Uh, and uh, when I, you know, when I think about the layers of my own identity, I, I, and I think it's, it's about fifth or sixth in a layer, you know, many, if, if you're looking at, the, um, you know, the sort of identity politics writ large, um, I do think uh, that this has been a struggle for, um, I don't know, I, I look at her because we were young lawyers, she was even younger than I, uh, back in the day, you know, in the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, which is when uh, we were doing uh, legal work together. And I have to say that Irv was <coughs> asking just those questions and has continued to ask those questions for the last 30 years. So they're not, uh, they're not new questions, although you, you stated them extremely artfully. 
and um, you know it's obvious that you're you're doing some deep uh, thinking and uh, reading and uh, um, and the like about what I think are major challenges to this movement. These movements um, always have been, and uh, presumably, I guess, will continue to be. Um, I don't know. Yeah, please. Yeah, I sure. should follow up on what Ellie was saying. Uh, this is, I, I, I have no answer for this. If I did, you know, I could retire. Uh, the, the part of the problem is that the, the movements that form around particular kinds of identity are often, you know, done so through a process of kind of, of, of fortifying one's defense against a hostile culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you live in a culture that is patriarchal, you live in a culture that is racist, you live in a culture that's homophobic, xenophobic, name your phobia, um, which is a system of power meant to diminish and dehumanize one group of people against the perceived norm that is heavily materially supported and reinforced, that there's an understandable insularity that develops yes. because it's a protective mechanism against this hostile Indeed. culture. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of process of, of forming an identity, which itself is coalition, particularly in the LGBT community or movement, is something that is necessary, frankly, to marshal the kind of resources and sort of courage and resilience and so forth to fight mm -hmm. this war, which is a war. And yet at the same time, it's absolutely essential as Kenji Ishino said last night, and as many people in this room know and understand and written about and talked about, that we have to figure out where we're going to build those coalitions externally beyond the protective shield of our own particular identity um, in order to change those institutions of power and, 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 and public perception about who we are as a community and a movement. But, so how do you make those choices? How do you figure out who to sort of, you know, put the shield down for a second and say, join us. Like, how do you do, because that's absolutely essential, but how do you figure that out and build those coalitions in a way that is um, productive in fighting that war? Well, I would only observe uh, one thing and then uh, turn it over to others who have questions. Um, in, in our day, it was women who made those judgments and articulated those positions and uh, reached out to allied, uh, to allied movements, um, in part because we were part of them and recognized it as such. Maybe in a, it was easier to recognize uh, a woman as part of the women's movement uh, and as uh, part of the feminist movement and as part of the uh, gay movement. You know, I mean, it, it was sort of, it was staring you uh, right in the face. Although I do remember being accused in, in pre-AIDS times, uh, uh, gay men and lesbians were often at each other's throats. Uh, men exercising their privilege and women exercising their lack of privilege and that created enormous conflict in the movement. But um, to the extent that uh, coalitions were developed, uh, um, connections were made. Uh, it was the woman who uh, exerted that leadership, and that was only exacerbated um, and accentuated uh, with um, with uh, coming of AIDS. So that's how things were in that day, at least in my own yeah. humble interpretation. And then I'm going to have to step out. So go ahead. Well, I just wanted to thank you for the, the speech. <coughs> the, the idea that the younger crowd needs to start rising up and taking control in many cases. I, I do have. Step aside. Uh, I don't want you guys to step aside. We need help coordinating these things. We need your experience and ability. Yeah, don't go away. We don't leave. Don't, don't leave. Please. No, I know. My oh, son God. says the same thing, Mom. I just need to know that he's 26. And he's like, I just need to know that you're there. I don't yeah. need you interfering. I just need to know that you're there. So uh, we're here. We're still here. So not, not to offend anyone, but who do we who do we feel would be you know the kingmaker here? Who do we think we could go to and say, we need coordination of these services? Because as our keynote last night said, the NAACP had a very laser pointed, like just completely planned to the T how they were going to attack systems of oppression. The LGBT movement doesn't have that. And we have a lot of people, like the HRC, the uh, National Center for Gay and Lesbian Rights, we have, we have like the task force, we have people all that have power in some respect, but 
many of these organizations don't really represent the entirety of the situation. So who can we plan on being there, or should we form as a community one overarching umbrella? Is what what are your thoughts about that? I, I've I don't. I'll tell that. you. I, I know where it's not going to come. It's not going to come. Well, it's not just, not just HRC. <laughs> it's not going to come from the HRC, and it's not going to come from the task force. Uh, love them both as I do. It's not going to come from NCLR. I mean, my you know my you know they my baby. It, it's not going to come from them either, because I it, or. Lambda or it, it, uh, exclusively, uh, do we need the, do those all of those organizations need to continue to do their work? Yes, they do. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's going to come from this new ethos, and I wanted to suggest some of the places where it's going to come from. Whether it, in this movement, it's never gonna, there's never going to be a monolith. I don't know that there's going to there never has been. A king maker or a king or a queen, mommy, mommy, I can <laughs> or a princess for that matter. Yeah, uh, uh, we have we met too many queens. Too many queens. <laughs> <laughs> too many queens, <laughs> Wait, too many queens and queens. not enough princesses. <laughs> 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 um, uh, but uh, you know, I don't really know. But then again, I lack imagination. Um, I'm hoping, you know, I, I believe that you'll you'll create the places from whence this will come. I can take one more question, and I, I have a plan to catch. I'm sorry. Did you want this person? Yes, yes please. thank you. Um, I wonder if, uh, if one went from a rights perspective to a justice perspective that we might be moving in the right direction. That is, rights that are dependent upon readings of law and precedent and blah, 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 have limits, whereas maybe in the John Rawls sense of justice, there are more universal <coughs> themes that we should be working on that would help us to see commonalities also with other oppressed groups. Because injustice, <coughs> to me, is something that's almost more shareable than a denial of rights, and um, I mean, this is just forming in my head, sure. so forgive me. But, but, uh, but then also when we speak to Urbishi's, um conundrum about how do we stop this assumption that everything lies in individual solutions, um, I want to tie it into a, a talk that was given just the other day at the Harvard Ed School by a woman named Niobe Way, who's from NYU, and talks about what happens to boys when they go from early adolescence to late adolescence. The very dear, dear love relationships that they have with other boys have to be disowned. And they do that in a framework that maturity requires individuality, not friendships and codependence, and a distancing from the female um, sexuality, certainly, a no homo kind of thing. If we could get at that before it happens to create a culture in schools, certainly in the later years anyway, when kids are beginning to move away from this kind of communal sharing of, of prop, you know, it's the if they talk about, these are the people I talk to about my problems, you know, my buddies that I love. You know, and then all of a sudden it's, I can't do this anymore. This is not what it means to be an adult. This is certainly not what it means to be a man. Um, so I think partly, the, I was saying just as a side comment, I think partly the fights between the men and the women in the gay movement have been that we men have been socialized to think of these individual kinds of solutions and women were much more w willing to work together and share not only intellectually but also spiritually and emotionally. I am so very sorry but I can't miss my plane. I have a loved one meeting me on the other side. So. Well, we're well, going to thank you again.